because to have all the buttons control. Yeah. And At Atoli it. just arrived, so I'll make him uh, a co-host as well. And then we'll be only missing Andre de Oveiro. So go ahead, João. Okay, then first I would like to congratulate the main organizers for this lightweight uh, online meeting, okay? And I have to introduce the, the next speaker that, uh, that will be Federico Sanchez from Conicet, Argentina, that will talk about the Pierre Roger Observatory results and perspectives. Please, Federico, go ahead. Ah, one thing. Uh, people, prepare your questions, please. We have five, 15 minutes for questions, okay? So prepare your questions, please. Go ahead, Federico. Okay, thank you for the invitation to give this uh, review of the results and the perspective of the Pirocheiro Observatory. So I will share my screen. Okay, please, uh, can you tell me if you are seeing everything? Yeah, right? yeah, very well. Okay, so I will, uh, I will be, uh, make a, a report of uh, what are the, the latest results of the, of the Piero Sher Observatory and why we, we are uh, facing a new, a new, uh, um, upgrade of our of our detection system in order to see the uh, try to solve all the open questions that are still uh, are still around. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk, a brief introduction of the topic of the ultra high energy cosmic rays, and a description of the of the detection system of the Pierogi Observatory and how we are planning, actually we are already building the, the upgrade of this, of, of this system that we call OG Prime. And then I will go through the three main uh, results, uh, which uh, are the energy spectrum that we mentioned with the, with the observatory, the, the, the composition the, the, that we are able, what, the information about the composition we are able to, to extract from our data, and how the uh, the the rival direction the, the, the we see from the from the observatory. So these are the main three topics, and then I will draw a, a sort of conclusion. So, uh, what is the the main topic is uh, and why it is it is difficult uh, to to observe? Basically, we have at some point uh, sources that we are trying to identify. Uh, since many years, and uh, they, they, they are in, there are some transfer of the energy from microscopic events towards these uh, microscopic particles, and they start to propagate. Uh, they, and they they have some uh, uh, spectrum in the in the injection point. They start to propagate through the universe uh, during the process of the propagation. They lose energy. Uh, they uh, suffer spallation processes, so they change their, their, their nature, and they are also deflected uh, by means of the electric, uh, of the magnetic field that are uh, everywhere, intergalactic and galactic magnetic field. So when they arrive to, to Earth, this is, it, it is very difficult to extrapolate where they are coming from. And so to, to summarize the main three questions that we want to, to, to answer regarding the ultra high energy cosmic rays are where they, they come from, where are the sources of, this, of, this, uh, of these particles, uh, how they gain this, the, the energy, there are several competitive uh, processes, and what is the nature well, of, this, uh, of this particle, what kind of particles do they exactly are because the, the, the issue is that at, at, at the energy we are interested in when they arrive to the, to, the, to the Earth, we are not able to observe them directly uh, in order to see what kind of particles is 
they they are but we have to observe indirectly through the what we call the extensive bell shower the, the the shower of secondary particles they generate once they hit the 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 the, the, the nucleus of the of the molecules on the in the top of the of the atmosphere there is a lot of particles uh, that are sketched here in the left uh, in the left uh, hand uh, uh, plot and there are some of the of these components of the of the showers of the particles that are accessible if we put uh, uh, detectors on, on on ground so basically they are the muons that are the product of the decay of the pion and the kaons mainly uh, and we have what we call the electromagnetic component that all the uh, gamma the, the photons and the electron and positrons that generate basically through brain but on top of this, there is uh, the radiation that is emitted uh, during the propagation in the in the atmospheres, both in the in the in the way of uh, uh, fluorescence light that can be observed during the nights, or also as I will show you uh, next, uh, also in, by means of radio of radio emission. So, what are the main difference between the different kind of nucleus that kind of right to the uh, to the top of the atmosphere, and basically the heavier the the, the particle is, the shallower the, uh, the, is the development in the atmosphere. So the number or the, the maximum of number of particles that are generated occurs uh, higher in the in the atmospheres, while the uh, light particles develops. Uh, slow, uh, more slowly, and then the maximum is reached closer to the closer to the ground. But on top of this, also because thinking of a superposition uh, process, uh, basically uh, an um, iron nucleus is uh, uh, <clears throat> um, fifty-six uh, proton proton uh, and, uh, particles, and therefore. The, the fluctuation of the of the heavy particle are less than uh, the fluctuation of these processes uh, uh, with respect to the to to like to like particles. So, what is even though the the, the cosmic rays are a, a, a phenomenon that occurs in many in many in many astrophysical processes, the ones that we are interested in are the very tail of the of the spectrum that, that is observed uh, on Earth. And it is depicted here, uh, ranging from somehow 10 to the uh, 17 to uh, the very end of the, of the spectrum. What is worth noting is that uh, the, the spectrum decays as a, as a power law with an index of uh, roughly minus three, and that uh, the, the flux is very low. So as you may see around 10 to the 18, there is one particle per square kilometer per year. And in the very tail, there is one particle per uh, kilometer square per century. So if we want to gather good statistics in this very uh, end of the tail, we have to wait a century or we have to build a huge observatory. So we obviously went through, uh, through this second, second option. Uh, zooming a little bit, uh, this, this end uh, part of the, of the spectrum, we see nevertheless that there are deviations regarding this uh, basically power law that I was talking before. And from this small deviation is where we have to extract uh, all the information regarding the, the the possible scenarios where they are, uh, 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 the, where they are generated. This, uh, the, the, what I call here the Auger energy domain at the beginning was uh, uh, from 10 to the 18 towards the end of the spectrum. With the years, we managed also adding some enhancements to the to the system to lower the energy threshold of the of the observatories down to. 10 to the 16, as I will show you later. The several uh, we put name to the several uh, changes in the in the in the behavior of the decay of the spectrum, and the within the the Auger domain we can clearly see right now the the second need, 
uh, knee because the, the, the spectrum goes, goes down and the ankle shape where the spectrum is, uh, is, is raised as, a, as an ankle and, and the suppression, which was not completely clear before the Diogere uh, era. What is also interesting to stress here is that uh, at the lower uh, at the lower um, edge of this of this energy range, we are already uh, uh, somehow overlapping the energy that is reached by the uh, LHC for the proton proton uh, collision. So uh, the 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 adronic models that we need to use in order to interpret our data are already uh, being tested in with the with the accelerators on. Uh, on uh, uh, available right now. Okay, so what is the, the Pirocher Observatory as it is uh, these days? Uh, mainly it consists of uh, 33,000 uh, kilometers square in order to gather good statistics at the very end of the, of the spectrum when the flux is very low. Um, covered by um, 1,600 watt and sharing of detector that are the ones that you may see here on the on the right top of the of the of the slide. These are the watt and sharing of detectors that are tanks filled with uh, with with water. When particles close to them, they generate sharing of light, and we 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 may collect this light through. Uh, through PM, PMTs and they cover a huge uh, area. There are uh, the space in between them is 1.5 kilometers, and, and this this array uh, is meant to observe the very end of the spectrum. But after this first array was completed in 2008, we start to deploy uh, uh, infill uh, array inside inside the main array in order to start to to lower the energy threshold and to cover the <laughs> The transition between the galactic cosmic ray and the extragalactic cosmic ray. Uh, so we build a, an, a, an array of uh, 23 uh, kilometers square with 61 water channel code detector. And, <clears throat> and in the very last year, we also uh, equip a, a smaller array embedded, embedded within the, the previous one of uh, almost two kilometers square with 19 water channel code detector in order to lower the energy threshold down to 0.3 uh, exa electron electron volt the, the 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 sum of this of this area is what uh, i show here in the in the circle uh, the jargon is put sd and the the spacing between the between the, the detectors so this uh this array uh, is uh, is overlooked by four fluorescence detectors that may operate during the night in order to observe the fluorescent light that was uh, um, indicating before. And these four sites are equipped with uh, six, uh, um, six uh, telescopes each that were looking uh, just on top of the, of the array covering uh, 30, uh, 30 times 30 uh, degrees in, in, view and, in view and angle and the minimum elevation was 1.5 uh, degrees above the above the ground. But when we started to lower the energy with the infills, then we also built in one of the of these uh, buildings uh, the same telescope, but pointing towards uh, higher in the in the atmosphere, where the minimum elevation was uh, 30 degree in order to see also the the, the showers that develop uh, higher in the atmosphere. Uh, but we did not stop here in, uh, in order to have also a clear measurement of uh, observables that are sensitive to the, to the mass composition of the, of the cosmic ray. We decided to install a dedicated muon detector in this, uh, in this infill, infill area, uh, both in the, in the 750 array and in the 433 array. And the, we have already operative and are marked here um, in, the, in this uh, green, green, greenish uh, color uh, where the, uh, the, this underground muon detector with, with which are plastic scintillators, sorry, 
uh, buried to 2.3 meters underground in order to shield all the electromagnetic particles that arrive, arrive on ground and only let the muons pass, uh, pass through them. They are already operative in 24 of these, of these stations and are already producing uh, a nice result. Uh, and uh, also, uh, this, this area was covered by what we call AERA, the radio detection of the of the of the of the of the shower that are developing. They are um, uh, 153 uh, antennas uh, covering the area basically uh, that is uh, where we have the SD 700, 750 with three different kinds of 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 antenna. So we started to operate this. We learned a lot with this with these uh, arrays. And what we are facing now is what we call the OJ prime, which is uh, we decided to to in, to in, in, enhance the, the the detection capability of the of the mass. And I will try to justify this decision in the following slide. Uh, all over the range of the uh, covered by the observatory, not only the low, the low energy, the low energy part, and therefore we decided to install surface uh, scintillator detector, very similar to the ones that we have buried in the infill area, but this time putting them on top of the of each of the tanks in the uh, three thousand kilometer square uh, array, and uh, we we will also add. A small PMT in the in the in the readout of the water channel code detector in order to 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 increase the dynamic range we are able to see with uh, with this with this detector and we will at the same time increase the sampling of the electronics also to have a better uh, resolution in the in the signal because basically all what we can extract from all this kind of detector is the size of the signal and the shape of the signal. So improving the, 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 the sampling will improve the timing, improving the dynamic range will improve uh, the size because we will not saturate uh, or we will saturate at a higher, at higher um, signal sizes. And therefore we will have a much better uh, resolution for the observables for doing physics. Okay, what uh, the secret of the of the of the Pierre Auger Observatory basically is this hybrid technique where we observe simultaneously a subset of all of our events with the fluorescent detector and the uh, surface detector. With the fluorescent, we basically follow all the longitudinal profile along the atmosphere of the of the of the showers, and therefore we can easily identify two things. The first thing is the where the maximum of the shower occurs. As I told you before, this is directly linked to the to the primary mass of the particle. And we, um, we can make a calorimetric measurement of the energy uh, that was deposited in the atmosphere and therefore infer the energy where uh, with uh, that, that the particle has at the top of the top of the atmosphere in a very clean clean way. And because the, there is a simultaneous detection, we can link the uh, the signal that we see on the ground by the water channel of detector with uh, with the energy observed in this calorimetric uh, way. Um, these are uh, examples of uh, of events with the name we decided to give to give them. We identify depending on who, in which in which of the arrays they fall. For example, we have SD 100, 150 vertical what is, is the, as this, the set of events that has a zenith angle degree less than uh, 60 degrees falling in the main array. SD 750 vertical is uh, the one that you can see here falling in the infill and with a zenith angle up to 40 degrees. And uh, we also have very inclined showers falling in the main array. Uh, this main incline means higher than 60 and, and less than 80 degrees, and which has a very different way of reconstructing the, 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 the events. And 
very soon we will have also the SP433 for the very low end of uh, the very low uh, part of the energy spectrum. So basically what we relate is a point of the, of in the lateral distribution uh, seen at ground and we convert them, uh, which is related to the energy and can be factorized in an energy dependent part and uh, attenuation geometric part. So we model this, uh, this uh, attenuation factor and we can convert all the, all the events of the same energy to a signal size in order to relate it to, with the energy that we observe in the calorimetric way. Uh, a slightly different um, procedure has to be done for the inclined shower because they are only made by uh, muons that are the only capable of our, uh, traverse all the, uh, the atmosphere at this, at this angle. So in all, it, we need a two-dimensional uh, map in order to be able to parameterize the, the signal. But once this, uh, oh, sorry. How we see the events from the from the uh, fluorescent uh, um, view, the what we call the hybrid is the standard one uh, is just the the, the 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 light that is observed by the cameras of the fluorescent detector and the the that is simultaneously seen by the water channel of detector. And this uh, this year we already were able to produce result of what with what we call the Cherenkov dominated uh, events in the fluorescent. These are the events that are basically facing your detector, and the the direct light from the Cherenkov uh, processes are, uh, are are the one that dominates the light in the in the camera. So <clears throat> uh, with all uh, this, we can. Uh, relate with calibration. This is how we calibrate in energy our events uh, with this subset uh, of hybrids. We relate the observable signal size uh, depending on the array uh, and the kind of, of, uh, of events, incline or main array or infill array. And we are able to observe uh, in this energy up from this energy that I show here in the in the right hand side so uh, in this way we we can build the 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 spectrum in a very wide energy energy range and this is how we uh, are observing the behavior of the of the spectrum from 10 to the 16 up to the subtraction 10 to the to the 20 uh, more or less with the different uh, with the different techniques, starting from the vertical the Cherenkov uh, fluorescent technique, which is the which which has extended uh, the the end of the the low the low energy part of the of the spectrum up to the um, uh, vertical uh, SD uh, seen by the by the main array. The resolution and the NR and the and their certainty are indicated here. If we combine all these measurements only in, in one single spectrum, uh, there are the, 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 the features of the spectrum that we, we already know that were, they were there, the second knee, very precisely measurement, the ankle, but we saw uh, for the very first time these two uh, new uh, feature of the spectrum, the, what we call the instep, which is this uh, plateau uh, if multiplied by Ten to the the, the, uh, the energy to the third here around ten to the nineteen uh, to ten to the nineteen point uh, six, and there there is also a low energy angle a recovering of the spectrum just below uh, the second knee. So to the previous que question that we want to answer that was mainly due uh, in the in the suppression uh, region and in the ankle region. Now we have new question that have to uh, explain this new feature that we were uh, uh, we have observed in the in the in the past uh, two years and are were presented this year in the ICR, ICRC. Federico, five minutes. Okay. Oh, I have to speed up. Okay, so uh, the other way where where we can we can from which we can extract uh, extract the the data the timing as I told you as I told you before 
And so we can also calibrate this, the timing of the signal in the water channel of detector with the fluorescent ones. And what is very interesting here is that uh, we can observe the development, uh, the maximum uh, of, the, of, of the events from uh, also very, very, um, very low energy up to uh, where the fluorescent start to not be efficient and the very tail of the spectrum, the coincidence is, is very good. And as you see, as we move towards the, the higher energy, the composition start to be uh, uh, um, heavier. And there is a break in the, in the evolution uh, uh, just below the, the anchor region. And this is seen also by the fluctuation that we are able to measure with, with the fluorescent light. But when we convert this to, to masses uh, using the available uh, adronic interaction model, we see that there is not an agreement, and this is because we the 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 the, uh, the, the, uh, the models are not reproducing the muons that we are observing in the in the in the in our data. We also made uh, some inference regarding the evolution of uh, uh, with the energy of the different composition without entering into the details. We see uh, basically that what I was uh, telling you before that before uh, is is uh, is hardly the favorite to think of the anchor as a propagation uh, effect, uh, and we because we need uh, we we have the presence of heavy particles in the at the very end of the of the spectrum. So we need to combine in order to try to limit our scenarios. We need to combine. Uh, the energies, the energy spectrum with the observation of composition, and this is uh, done uh, propagating particles through uh, some uh, candidate sources, uh, taking into account all the uncertainties and making assumption about the model for the photo disintegration cross section, the models of the extragalactic background line, and also the assumption on the interaction model, these are all, all our sets, our, our set uncertainties and systematic sets in, in our interpretation. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, we were able to make this exercise for the very high energy part of the spectrum. But uh, last year, we were able also to add what we call the low energy part of the spectrum in the same exercise. We consider two scenarios for the low energy part and um, where we, we have a scenario where there is a, a galactic contribution and an extra galactic contribution, but limited only to protons. And another scenario where we have several, no, we have no galactic contribution and several mixed uh, extra galactic com contribution similar to the high energy, high energy part. And I will show you here the, the results, the scenario where we have galactics, uh, is, uh, there is a contribution or below the ankle if the low energy part is of, if a, of pure or pure proton, and a contribution dominated by the intermediate mass massive uh, dominated by the by the nitrogen uh, is favorable. So I, as you see, the uh, combined speed of the spectrum and the composition and its fluctuation in this in these plots. Scenario B also has a, the high energy part has a very high spectrum and a mixed mass composition where uh, and nitrogen and helium are the dominant one and relative uh, low cutoff of, for the injection uh, spectrum. Okay, so <clears throat> just to arrive to the end, uh, we have observe a, a dipole distribution in the radar detection, very clear. This uh, 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 is a publication of 2017. Now it's even increased the significant modulation. It's uh, around six sigma at the six sigma level. And it's uh, five, uh, 125 degrees away from the galactic sector. So really favoring the, um, the extra galactic uh, um, origin of uh, of events above eight, uh, uh, ten to eight, eight uh, times ten to the eighteen electron volts. Um, and to finish, we also look 
all in the intermediate uh, and uh, scales, not only in the in the large angular scale as the dipole distribution and the very high energy, selecting different kind of, of sources. Basically, the Febre, we, we separate in two groups and in active galactic nuclei and star bus uh, galaxy following some uh, 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 requirements about the, the flux of the sources and the, and the distance they, they are. And uh, <coughs> testing it, the distribution we observe against the null hypothesis, which is the, the isotropy. And as you may see here, the, the, the conclusion is that the, 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 uh, the most, uh, the, 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 the threshold energy is around uh, 60 e, e exa electron volts for the IGN and, and around 40 for the Starbus, Starbus uh, galaxy. The Starbus galaxy has a significance of four sigma and, and the uh, active galactic nuclei is, is less, than, less than three. So the, the excess point towards the M83 and the NGS uh, for uh, uh, 49, 40 feet and Centaurus uh, in for the AGN and, and the Starbus galaxy is dominated by uh, Centaurus, Centaurus. So <laughs> this uh, makes me arrive to the conclusion. Basically, we have observed uh, very, very well-defined uh, changes in the spectra, uh, in the spectrum of high energy cosmic ray. We identify very clearly the, the, the ankle and the, and the second knee that were uh, there, but we also uh, have identified in the in the past two years new features, which is the the, the high energy instep and the low energy ankle just below the, the, the second knee. We <laughs> have established uh, a, a, what we call an, an, a standard scenario for the for the high energy part where. Uh, we have light but mixed composition dominated below the, the, the ankle region, and we have heavy nuclei towards the highest, the highest energy. We try to identify different kinds of source model, uh, taking into account uh, propagation from the sources uh, to the Earth, but this is very difficult due to the uncertainty that we have. And basically, these are related to the sensitivity that we have to the masses. So we need to increase this, this sensitivity. Regarding the anisotropy, we have more than five sigma uh, evidence that a uh, large angular scale, there is a dipole distribution for uh, events above eight to, to ten, eight times 10 to the 18 electron volts. And four sigma evidence at intermediate uh, angular scales and energy above uh, 30 or almost 40 exa electron volts. Uh, so all in all, we have a very nice set of, of data, but we, there are still many open questions and probably the most stringent one is that the one that I was uh, just mentioning briefly uh, before, the, that the hadronic interaction models that we, we have uh, are not reproducing the muons, and this is what we call the muon paxel. Uh, and this need to be solved, uh, basically increasing our sensitivity to the to the composition, uh, in order to uh, to be uh, able to to solve this uh, this kind of problem. Okay, sorry to to be a little bit fast. Okay, thank you, Federico. Now questions. I can see all the people, Rogério. Yeah, so uh, ah. you see the hands that are up, there's one. Okay, look. Antonio. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, so thank you for, for, for your talk, uh, very nice. Um, I would like to ask you about the, the, your results on the composition. Uh, especially noting that at higher energies you have a, a heavier, heavier composition. Uh, do you know if this is a effect of the propagation? Or if if the if iron, for example, uh, has a less tendency of getting absorbed than the proton uh, during the propagation, or could you comment a little bit? Please? Well, basically, the the what we are seeing is that we need to inject heavy particles at the sources. And this is not a propagation. This is not a propagation uh, effect. Actually, if it was, it would be a propagation effect. We would expect to see 
uh, lighter particles in the, the higher at the higher energy end of the of the spectrum, not the heavy ones. So because of this observation of, of, of heavy particles in the very at the very end of the spectrum, we, we started to <coughs> uh, see how we can inject uh, the part, uh, heavy particles at the sources and propagating them through through the propagating them up up to the to the earth and see how the the, the, the try to put constraint in 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 the injection spe uh, spectrum uh, as you may see here uh, basically I went a little bit fast here but what we can do is put uh, constraint on the on the cutoff of the spectrum uh, at the at the sources the, the things that are here highlighted by by these uh, red circles and the 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 percentage of of uh, of type of particles that we inject at the sources so we propagate through them and we fix uh, this value for the sources so it's not a propagation effect I and this is Thank the you. way Thank we you. okay more questions I have, I have a two. I have actually two questions for Federico. Uh, so thank you, thank you for your talk. First of all, Federico, it was very, very nice, and and it's nice to see new results coming from Roger. And so the first question is a question that came up uh, uh, in the first session of today. The fact: Can you actually are you is Roger sensitive to high energy photons? Because you mentioned protons and iron as primaries, but very high energy photons could also initiate a shower and. And that's uh, that's a question that came up this morning. So, are you sensitive to high energy photons as well? Well, I, yes, we can. We are sensitive sensitive to photon actually because, and we already put several limits to the. Let me see if I put it in the backup. Um, this is this is well, but this is not completely up to date. So this is an old slide I have, but. Basically, we can we are putting limit in, uh, to the photons uh, in a wide energy range, depending on on uh, which of the technique we are using. Probably the most uh, the most stringent will be at the at the very end of the of the of the of our energy of our energy range because there we have uh, the dedicated muon muon detector and therefore already operate, operating and therefore. We can very easily and, and uh, very efficiently discriminate a photon, a photon shower than a bionic shower because of the lack of muon. If we observe a shower without muon, this is a smoking gun for a photon for a photon shower. So what, once we are, we will be able with OJ Prime also uh, to to discriminate muon and component and electromagnetic component. The, the observation of the of the photon discrimination will be boost highly. So so far we have the problem that our detectors measure all the particles uh, at the same time, so muons and electromagnetic part, and it's very difficult to discriminate one one of the other. So far we put limits we we uh, to the to the photon flux, but we we weren't able to identify photons. We can put upper limit to the flux. Because we cannot discard any a fluctuation of an adronic uh, shower, but once we will uh, be able to to discriminate, and this is one of the main objectives of the OJ prime and the and the surface scintillator on the top, we will have the same capability we have right now at the at the lower edge of the spectrum at the higher one, and, okay. and therefore we will limit a lot the the, the this the these uh, fluxes. Okay, and the second question is about OJ prime. So, what is the timeline for OJ prime? When the uh, uh, the uh, underground muon detectors and the surface scintillator detectors and the radio uh, array will be uh, ready? And so, what is the timeline for for the future? Well, uh, at the same time we are running this uh, Silafi meeting, we have the OJ meeting, so I can tell you the the picture of yesterday. And basically, we are very, very advanced in the deployment of the surface scintillator detector. Very, very advanced means almost 80% of the 33,000 uh, square meter is already covered by the scintillator detector. Uh, 
uh, um, but not of them are already equipped with the electronics and the, the PMT they need for, for operate, only a subset, uh, roughly 20% of this 80% uh, has uh, already the new electronic and is equipped with the, with the PMT in order to start uh, taking data. Uh, so uh, we foresee that by the, uh, we are in 2021, right? By the end of 2022, I think we will be uh, start gathering data from the from OJ Prime. And uh, for uh, the underground new detector, we are foreseeing to finish it, uh, to finish, uh, yes, uh, the construction by July next year. Uh, so we have the material already and we are finishing half of the infill and we will finish the roughly the second half next year. Thank you, Federico. Okay. Any other question? We have time for one more question or two. Uh, well, I have one question. I, I, I had a seminar about collaboration with other experiments. I think that's CTA. You could comment about this for the future. Co collaboration between Ocean and CTA, you mean? Yeah, uh, for, for the installation, for, for analyzing data in the future. Well, now, I don't know that. I don't know the timeline for the for um, for CTA right now actually, uh, but uh, so far I didn't know. I'm not aware of any formal uh, collaboration between CTA and NOJ. Uh, maybe when they start to to have data, we will convey in something. But so far, I'm not aware of of any collaboration. Formal okay. collaboration, I mean, no. Okay. Well, any other question? Well, then let's thank the speaker. Thank you, Federico. Okay, and thank you now we will start with.